Schoolgirl Jeanette Tate had stepped out from her home in Owlsbear, Devon in England, on a bright Saturday afternoon in August 1978 for her paper route, like every other weekend. On her blue Kalkoff bike, she rode to the nearby White Horse Inn to start her work, and even met two of her friends for a chat just after 3.15 p.m. But for school pals Margaret Heavey and Tracy Pratt saying goodbye to her as she left them to finish off the route, this would be the last time she would be seen. Ten minutes later, they came across her bike lying on the ground. Newspapers spilled across the ground, but Jeanette was never to be seen again. From that moment, the little girl became the face of one of the country's most notorious missing people's cases. Unlike some cases, the police acted incredibly quickly and mounted a huge search, including an RAF helicopter. The village hall became an impromptu investigation center but as hours turned to days, there was little to suggest where Jeanette could have been. Two holiday makers staying in the picturesque village came forward to tell police they had seen a man in a car where the girls had been. That vehicle was never traced, and the person behind the wheel never identified. But by the end of the 1990s, serial child killer Robert Black was linked to the case by police, who had questioned him about it earlier that decade. In 2007, Devon and Cornwall police submitted a file to the Crown Prosecution Service, but it was said there was not enough evidence to charge him. Then, when Black was convicted in 2011 of the 1981 abduction and murder of Jennifer Cardi, nine years old, the hope was it could reopen investigations. But after Black died in prison in August 2016, police submitted another file but it said it would not make a decision on it. When Jeanette's father, John, died in 2020, he had said in his final interview he did not want to accept she could be dead. But before we go into the details of the happenings on that fateful day, let's delve into the history of the family. Jeanette was born in Taunton on 5 May 1965 to John and Sheila Tate. They moved to Cornwall before settling in Devon. Her parents eventually separated and her dad remarried. Jeanette, affectionately called Jenny, went to live with her dad as well as her stepmom, Violet, and stepsister Tanya, eventually settling in a small village in Devon called Allsbear in 1975, eight miles east of Exeter. She attended Exmouth Comprehensive School about 10 miles from her home. Her family lived in a cottage called Barton Farm Cottage at the end of a farmhouse not far from the local church. Allsbear, in fact, is such a quaint little village that it only has one main road with a lane, a post office, a pub, and a community hall in addition to the church. The population at the time was 500. It was the type of place 
where everybody knew everybody else. By age 13, Jeanette had a boyish haircut and was five feet tall. She was shy, enjoyed school, and her ability at masks had amazed her family, even from a young age. She didn't seem particularly unhappy and never showed signs of wanting to run away from home. She loved animals, writing, and composing poetry, and was curious about the world, a facet of her personality which helped her to overcome a natural shyness. Leading up to this day, Jeanette had been working the paper route. She was not the regular delivery person, but had agreed to take over for the paper boy for a week. The week passed without incident. However, on her very last day, her life changed forever. The morning of the 19th of August began as normal. John went out early around 7.30 a.m. to take his wife into work at the hospital in Exeter. On his way home, he stopped at GP surgery as he was suffering from a sore throat. Then he was back home at 10 a.m. to make sure the two girls were up before making breakfast. Afterwards, the girls went out to get sweets. Tanya was preparing to go on holiday with her birth father to Cornwall, just across the border from Devon. So at 12.20 p.m., John drove Tanya and her boyfriend to Exeter to catch her coach. Before taking Tanya to the coach station, he offered to take Jeanette with them, but she didn't want to come. He left her sitting on the lawn with her puzzle books as he pulled away. He would never see her again. After dropping off Tanya, John drove to collect Violet from work. They went shopping in Exeter and stopped at Dinkle's department store where he returned a broken plate. Jeanette would be working that afternoon as a relief paper girl. Sometime after 2 p.m., Jeanette picked up her blue Kalkoff bike and headed out of her cottage. She cycled along Within Lane towards the A3052. She stopped at White Horse Inn to collect the Express and Echo newspapers from the delivery van and headed back the way she had come, delivering the newspapers as she went. Since it was the last day of the week, she collected payment from customers as she went, storing the coins in her little purse. By 3.15 p.m., she had traveled about two-thirds of the way, delivering 40 newspapers, whereupon she happened upon two friends, Tracy Pratt and Margaret Heavey. They were meandering along Within Lane and stopped at that little bridge that went over the river. Jeanette dismounted her bike and the girls chatted and decided to walk towards Allsbear together. She pushed her bike up a small incline at, as it was easier than pedaling uphill. The two girls were walking behind. After taking time out with her friends for a few minutes, she had to get on with her route. So she climbed back on her bike and cycled off into the distance, leaving her friends reading one of the newspapers. She was in sight of the girls after taking off for about 50 meters until she got around a bend. This was the last time she was seen. Between five to 10 minutes later, Tracy and Maggie walked round the bend in Within Lane only to find her abandoned bicycle. It was on its side, the wheels still spinning, her newspapers lay around, and even her purse 
of customer's payments remained on her bike. The girls looked about themselves, over hedgerows, etc., and found no Jeanette. They began yelling for Jeanette, but heard nothing. This was odd, as they had just been speaking. It was like she'd vanished. All that was left was her bike and whatever was left in her basket. They decided to check at her house, so they picked up the bike with Maggie riding it. On the way back, they came across Jeanette's 16-year-old boyfriend, Tony Hammond, and the regular paper boy, John Bathard. Both boys joined in the search. When Maggie arrived at Jeanette's house, she was met by John Tate. She asked if Jeanette was home, which was met with bemusement by her father, as he thought she was out delivering the newspapers. When Maggie informed John that Jeanette was missing, he changed his mood to moderate concern. This was out of the ordinary, but surely there'd be a logical explanation. He put his shoes on and accompanied Maggie to Jeanette's last known destination. They shouted her name, looking everywhere, but no one responded. As the evening set in, Violet, who had come home from work with John Tate, suggested that they inform the police, and John agreed. It was such a small village, and there really wasn't many places she could have been. They called the police around 5 p.m., and John went to Alsbear Police and explained how Jeanette had not been seen for several hours. He was put through to the Exeter Police Headquarters. Police mobilized quickly, releasing dogs and a helicopter went into air. Time was of the essence, as the first 24 hours of missing children is crucial. And they had lost hours. As details were released, they described her as being boyish, five feet tall, with brown hair, suntanned, wearing a white t-shirt with her name embroidered on it in red letters on the left shoulder brown trousers, and white plimsolls. Over the next couple of days, the investigation got underway. Police searched all the grasslands and gore areas, ponds, and dense woodlands, but found nothing. Because of that, they did daily press conferences and reenactments. There was also a body double to jog someone's memory. They even called in the Royal Marines. John was investigated, but had an alibi for 3.27 p.m. when Jeanette disappeared. Eric Rundle, an experienced detective superintendent, split detectives into three teams. One the search team, two, the suspect team looking into obvious suspects like a list of sex offenders, pedophiles, and anyone with indecency claims against them, and three, a house-to-house -house inquiries team, which knocked at every door in the area and had the occupants fill out forms and details of their movements on that Saturday afternoon. Despite all that, nothing stood out and no suspects were initially identified. A breakthrough, however, happened a day after the disappearance. A policeman's wife, Matilda Rogers, and her 14-year-old daughter, Gail, walked into the village community hall with a sighting. 
On the day in question, Matilda and Gail had been walking on Within Lane and noticed the two girls, Tracy and Maggie. She even talked to them, asking if there were any local events. Matilda and Gail were on holiday from Hull, so they were unable to know what was going on. They left the two girls and carried on to the bungalow where they were staying. Not too far from the bridge Tracy and Maggie had been standing at. Matilda recalled seeing a car heading along Withan Lane towards Allsbear Center in the direction of Jeanette. Matilda remembered the car passing her at the time in question because she had to squeeze into the hedge about 300 yards away from where the bicycle was found. Matilda was seen as credible, especially as a policeman's wife. She described the car as shiny and either red or maroon, possibly a Triumph Dolomite or a 1300. The driver was described as a young man, 18 to 25, with thick blackish hair cut short and parted left, and a pale complexion with thick blackish eyebrows and a light colored shirt with the sleeves rolled up. Overall, he had a tidy appearance. The decision was made that there needed to be a nationwide search because there were numerous red cars in the southwest of England alone at the time, and Allsbear is near the M5 motorway. So, the police admitted that Jeanette's probable abductor could have been more than 100 miles away by the time their hunt started. They alerted the national media and provided a photo fit of the driver of the car, along with a detailed description. Matilda underwent hypnosis to bring out further details about the maroon car and driver. She managed to recite partial plate numbers, which were run through the police databases, but nothing brought about a match for the maroon car. Why was the car focused on? Within Lane was narrow, so two cars could not pass each other. Also, it is unlikely another car had approached from the other end of the lane, grabbed her and driven back, as there was no space for that kind of maneuver. Police asked volunteers to search Woodbury Common, which was roundly attended by thousands and dubbed Jeanette's Army. The search of the common was, however, solely based on a hunch which turned up no leads. By October 1978, the reward was capped to 23,000 pounds as someone might withhold information based on hoping to get more money. Hoaxes abounded and many psychics came forward claiming they knew what had happened, showing up at the Tate's home, which upset them. However, the police decided to bring in Gerard Croset, a Dutch parapsychologist and psychic who had been working with Dutch authorities on missing person cases and unsolved murders. He got international acclaim in 1966 after being asked to comment on the disappearance of the Beaumont children in Australia, where Jane, Anna, and Grant Beaumont went missing after visiting Glenick Beach near Adelaide in Australia. His information, nonetheless, didn't lead to their discovery. During the 70s, Croset continued to consult on cases. In this case, he was taken out to Isles Bear, and he looked at the maps to see if he could feel where Jeanette was, which was his method. 
When driving around, however, he had police stop at a quarry and said there had been a killing, but said it was in the future and it wasn't Jeanette. Frustratingly, he couldn't pinpoint a specific murder at a specific time. He also talked about a pond that Jeanette could be in, but police could locate nothing. His advice did not lead to her discovery. This focus on mediums took up a lot of valuable time. And by the end of 1978, almost 100 mediums had contacted police. As 1978 turned into 1979, the police continued to try to find leads, although it was proving difficult. They were convinced someone had abducted her during her journey, but who did it? Jeanette's family tried to keep her name in the press, but news of her began to wane. By May 1979, they said they wanted to set up a charity called International Find a Child. John Tate also wrote a book about Jeanette called Jeanette is Missing to help with her search, and people came forward with new leads. The anniversary of her appearance came round, and a photograph from John Tate's book was circulated to the media. It was featured in national newspapers. Police went to Allsbear to talk to holiday makers in hopes one of them might have been there the year prior and saw something. The main lead was still the man in the car. Through hypnosis, it was believed the registration number was BM1G or MB1G. However, 19,000 with similar plates were checked and 20 were red or maroon. All 20 were eliminated. The police appealed to the public that anyone who knew of a red car during the time should contact them. 7,000 local people had helped with the search, which showed the community was close-knit. However, as with all cold cases, attention begins to wane, and the police eventually scale down the investigation. There are several possible theories about who might have been involved. Number one, the John Tate theory. Police became more desperate as time passed, offering initially a thousand pound reward as well as hiring spiritualists and clairvoyants, but to no avail. However, one proved to be the undoing of John Tate. Robert Cracknell was given access to the Tate family. He said that Jeanette had passed away and she told him that her father had abused her. John Tate later admitted that he had in fact abused Jeanette when questioned about it. He has never faced charges for this and the police never revealed it as they didn't want to lose public support for the search for Jeanette and sway public opinion. It seems that child abuse and child sexual abuse was rife in the area of Allsbear in the late 1970s. This has caused consternation as to why John Tate wasn't looked into further. For some reason, the police seemed adamant that John had nothing to do with it and had an airtight alibi. Number two, the Robert Black theory. As years went on, the case became cold. No suspects were ever uncovered, not even clothing found. Some 20 years later, a Scotsman Robert Black was placed into the center of the investigation. He was a notorious child killer, four murders and sexual assault charges. 
His victims consisted of five-year-old Carolyn Hogg, nine-year-old Jennifer Cardi, 10-year-old Sarah Harper, and 11-year-old Susan Maxwell. He might have been placed as a suspect in the Janet Tate situation because the case was unsolved. Robert Black had been in Exeter on the day Jeanette vanished. He was a postal delivery driver, enabling him to move quickly and unnoticed. Because of his need to keep full receipts for his job, it was determined he had purchased fuel from a station in Exeter on that day. A witness also recalled that he had been sitting in his van, staring at her five-year-old daughter. He drove off, heading in the direction of Allsbear, and there was also a witness who saw him acting suspiciously at Exeter Airport on August 19th, the day of Jeanette's disappearance. This is compelling circumstantial evidence. However, there is no physical evidence linking him to Jeanette's disappearance. His van didn't even match the maroon car. Robert Black's red van was not spotted in Allsbear by any witness, yet the police seemed convinced he had done it. However, John Tate was not convinced. The suspicion surrounding Robert Black culminated in the case being nearly brought to trial, but for Robert Black's sudden death by heart attack in 2016 in a Northern Ireland prison. Prosecutors sought to try him post-mortem, but it was deemed not in the public's interest. Number three, Melvin Brady's theory. Melvin Brady claimed to have met Jeanette's killer 48 hours after her disappearance. He said he was in Dalwood, 20 miles east of Allsbear, at Tucker's Arms, where he used to play darts, when a man seemed to be up to no good. This was two days after Jeanette went missing. Melvin worked for a company in Axminster in Devon, and he popped into the pub to get a packet of cigarettes. He said while he was in there, this man came in looking really shifty. You could tell he wasn't from around there. The guy parked his car on the corner, not right outside the pub which is strange. And when the police released a photo of the man supposedly seen by the woman who said she'd seen a man in a car on Within Lane, he matched that description perfectly. He was wearing a white shirt with rolled up sleeves, black trousers and brown shoes. The car was not a Triumph, but a chocolate-covered Alfa Romeo Spider, which had been modified and had a vinyl roof, low wheels, and a low sump. He reported this to the Heavy Three police two weeks after the disappearance, but no one followed up with him on his claim. He went on to great lengths to identify witnesses and piece together what he believed happened. He believes the man was a member of the armed forces and was based in Taunton, but undergoing training near Exeter. He believes this man was returning to his base in Taunton when he met him. He believes Jeanette was dumped in Woodbury Woods. Notwithstanding this, police in Devon and Cornwall said this information has not proven to be helpful in the inquiry. Of all the theories advanced to explain her disappearance, the most popular was that she was abducted by this man in a car who had passed her as she was cycling on her paper route and waited for her in a farm gateway. Her two school friends first claimed they hadn't seen a car, but then claimed to have remembered it. 
However, they couldn't tell the police anything more. Number four, the runaway theory. Being a runaway was assumed, but her clothes and money were at home. Moreover, she was going back towards her home on her route, so it wouldn't have made any sense for her to run away while her personal belongings and money she would need for survival were at home. Number five, the theory she was taken from hidden nooks. There are some passing spots in farm lanes where you can get your farm equipment back to the different fields. This person would have had to have been hiding or just waiting there, got her, turned around, and got out without anyone seeing them, and got out of there even while her bike wheel was still spinning. This had to have happened within a couple of minutes. Number six, the theory local sex offenders were involved. Devon and Cornwall is prolific with sex offenders. Hence, local sex offenders got questioned. This makes perfect sense, but for the fact that Within Lane is not the best place to be hunting for children as it is too narrow and windy. Within Lane at the time was crushed gravel. You could see dust lifting when cars pass. Also, it was her route for the day, so it wasn't like somebody could have watched her habits specifically over time. Robert Black's victims were all girls, not boys. He would have had to have known she was covering for the day. It obviously was someone who was watching her over a period of time and took advantage of her vulnerability on that particular day, as this was an activity she didn't do all the time. Robert Black's M.O. was to just dump bodies. However, her body has never been found. He wasn't a clever criminal who would hide the bodies but would dump them like rubbish. Finding the wheel spinning could have meant Jeanette was right there on the other side of the hedgerow, but there were no obvious suspects. Number seven, the theory she was hit by a car. Did a car hit her and kill her and just get rid of her body? Probably not. The girls would probably have seen that, or at least the tire tracks and dust. What if it was a local person, like a local farmer, who hit her coming out of a farm lane because he wasn't paying attention, knowing it was John Tate's daughter, picked her up, tossed her in the back of their Land Rover, and disposed of her body on their farm somewhere? The police didn't check every single acre of every single farm. Is it possible she was disposed of on a farm? Number eight, the Peter Tobin theory. A Sunday newspaper article in Scotland claimed that a Peter Tobin was to be questioned about Jeanette's disappearance. He is a convicted pedophile. He was found guilty of the 2008 killing of a Polish student whose body he buried underneath a Glasgow church. He was also convicted of the murder of Vicki Hamilton in December 2008, which resulted in his minimum sentence being increased to 30 years. Then he was convicted of the 2009 murder of Diana McNichol. He lived on the South Coast during the 70s, fitting insulation in homes and businesses. Because he was a convicted pedophile, they believed that had something to do with it, although nothing has come of it. Number nine, the abducted by a UFO theory. 
One man claimed she was abducted by UFOs and would be returned one day. Moreover, her friends, Tracy and Maggie, who she'd been talking to just before disappearing, claimed their first thought was that she had been abducted by a UFO. In fact, the headline of the Express and Echo newspaper she had been delivering that very day read, UF Autograph, An Encounter of the Flying Dutchman. There had been a possible UFO sighting over Exeter, which turned out to be a plane landing at the airport. This was the headline Tracy and Maggie were reading that very day while meandering on the lane of Jeanette's disappearance. Number 10, the power electricity station theory. There is also a website run by Robert Cracknell, a psychic detective. He reports on his website that the day after Jeanette disappeared, a small power electricity station exploded in the same lane where her bicycle was discovered. He wondered if she was buried in that spot, and the killer thought it would be an ideal way of disposing of her body by blowing up the electricity station. And finally, number 11. The Ian Beely Theory Ian Beely was convicted for the murder of Virginia Mounder nearly three years after the disappearance of Jeanette Tate. However, with respect to Jeanette, at 2.30 p.m. on the 19th of August, 1978, Beely did his last job at a farm seven miles away from Allsbear. He was working for the Artificial Insemination Unit near Exeter Airport, a mile from Allsbear. According to a detective, it was established that he left a farm premises from 2.30 to 2.35. They timed his movements, and there is a gap between 3 and 3.45 p.m. This is 45 minutes where he couldn't be accounted for. He turned up at the artificial insemination unit and he filled out an accident report form because earlier that day, he had been in a state of nervous tension and crashed into a police car. He, however, did not receive the attention from police that Robert Black did. It should be pointed out, however, that there are several serious issues which forces one to call the investigation into question. First of all, the House to House Inquiries team relied on the honesty of the person filling out the forms with little checking. Thus, a potential suspect could have avoided detection. Second, the theory that she might have run away from home didn't seem like a likely cause of her disappearance because she would have had to have ditched her bike in the middle of the lane with a purse full of money and she had savings at home, which she didn't take. Third, the claim by Tracy and Maggie that Jeanette had been abducted by a UFO is strange in that it relates to a headline seen on the front page of the newspaper Jeanette had just given them a few minutes earlier. Why would they even say that? Perhaps they aren't as innocent as they portray themselves. Or somebody they saw in the lane is somebody they know. Moreover, Tracy and Maggie's initial denial they had seen the maroon car that the policeman's wife, Matilda Rogers, and her daughter, Gail, a.k.a. the car witnesses, claimed to have seen, is rather puzzling. In fact, the car witnesses claimed to have seen the car move towards, then past them. Additionally, 
Tracy and Maggie claimed they were there to spot a potential boyfriend, yet they didn't see the young man with the fancy car passing them blaring loud music. Tracy and Maggie were unaware that another witness, a farmer, was working in a field across from her route. The farmer claimed that the girls showed no signs of panic as they came across Jeanette's bike. He heard no calling out for Jeanette whatsoever. On top of that, since the two girls had moved the bike when looking for Jeanette, this represented tampering with evidence. In fact, any photos of the downed bike were just a reconstruction as they had ridden the bike all the way to John Tate's house to supposedly inform him of Jeanette's disappearance, but then strangely wrote it back to leave it in the same location as it was found with the newspapers fanned out across the road. What was the purpose of that? Fourth, a man and his wife, the Gormans, claimed to have seen the maroon car in Aylesbear the afternoon of Jeanette's disappearance. The couple were in a car and were stopped at the Aylesbear crossroads and saw a maroon triumph traveling quickly through the village towards Exeter and the airport. Immediately afterwards, they turned onto Withen Lane and saw no bike whatsoever lying in the road. Given how narrow Withen Lane is, this would be nearly impossible. They would have had to have seen it. However, an explanation can be afforded. What they did see were two girls in Withen Lane, one of them riding a bike, as soon as the news broke about what had happened that day, the couple went to the Heavy Tree Road police station to make a statement. Yet somehow this statement got lost by the police. Bizarre. Moreover, a local farmer claimed that Jeanette's father owned a Maroon Triumph as well that he usually drove. This statement was strangely denied by senior detectives of the police, somehow making evidence vanished yet again. Despite this, Jeanette's stepsister Tanya confirmed that John Tate did indeed own a Maroon Triumph, but that he had sold it a couple of weeks before Jeanette disappeared. Strange coincidence. Additionally, a friend of Tanya said she had also seen the Maroon Triumph, but was afraid to report it. What is shocking is that the person seen driving the Maroon Triumph remarkably matched Ian Beely's appearance, judging from his age and description in 1978. He was also prone to driving along the lanes of Devon that he knew well probably looking for female victims. He was also seen by at least four independent witnesses at the correct time on the afternoon of Saturday, August 19, 1978. This maroon car was also seen on Wardrew Road, around the corner from Beely's address in the St. Thomas area of Exeter a few weeks following the events of 19th of August. Fifth, a witness has come forward and he has said that on the bus going to school in the morning, there was actually a huge amount of sexual abuse going on and he was sexually abused on the back of the bus by two girls. He kept quiet. His parents noticed there was something wrong with him after the incident, disheveled and tearful when he got home. He opened up and told his parents what happened. The two girls that are known in the investigation, Tracy and Maggie, are actually the ones 
who sexually assaulted him in the back of the bus. But what does this evidence suggest? It suggests that perverse sexual practices involving children were seen by a small number of abused children in the area as normal to the extent that what they had seen or worse been party to from a physical point of view had become commonplace or second nature. These children were so damaged that they seemed to have felt it normal to inflict a level of sexual abuse on other children in a very public place, the school bus. They obviously had a worrying level of confidence where such repugnant acts were concerned. One can infer then that there was widespread sexual abuse foisted on the children by most likely their parents. Clearly, such a scenario is one that fits with a number of families in 1970s Aylesbare. They certainly did not hold to the societal norms where morality and family are concerned. The children within these families would and could become targets of the most vicious forms of organized predatory pedophilia. And to whom could they turn for help? This state of affairs goes to the very heart of the Jeanette Tate case. Undoubtedly, Jeanette and her sister Tanya were the victims of sexual abuse, as can be gleaned from publicly available sources from Tanya's testimony and from John Tate's own admissions. Clearly such sinister, horrible, perverted, immoral, and abusive behaviors were not restricted to the Tate girls. Such things were relatively widespread in the area in which they lived. It is not surprising that certain elements wish to keep this information hidden. Generally speaking, when children are abused, they later become abusers. And so did the two girls. Did they abuse Jeanette in some fashion? Did they have anything to do with her disappearance? Were they jealous of her? Or was she sacrificed by them as part of some ritualistic pedophile reign. It is not surprising that the children and some adults in the village not connected to the ritual abuse had little faith in authorities to bring Jeanette's abductor to justice. Moreover, the children probably felt they couldn't trust adults. Hence, who could they confide in? Sixth, one of the things that is concerning is the precise timings that derive from the case evidence. Jeanette was known to have been working a route that had very precise timings. In other words, it could be determined to a mathematically high probability what time she would be where. It is known what time she left Allsbear when she picked up the papers from the stop on the main road, where and when Tony Hammond was on that afternoon, and when the various witnesses saw her in the lane. Such timings could also be gleaned from the regular paper boy in the village in terms of assuming her route and whereabouts. It could be assumed that Jeanette, on her first run, might be a few minutes slower. So the suggestion that there was a 
timed plan relating to her disappearance, rather than the fanciful suggestion of bad luck and trouble as far as the schoolgirl was concerned, makes much greater sense. Seventh, Ian Beely's murder of Virginia Mounder in February 1981, post-disappearance of Jeanette, points to some underlying sinister goings-on that could account for Jeanette's disappearance. On February 2nd, 1981, Virginia Mounder stepped off the train at St. David's Station, Exeter, at approximately 10 p.m. It was a foul and foggy night. The young woman did not have enough money to hire the usual taxi home and Given the particularly poor road conditions resulting from the inclement weather, she did not want to bring her father out on treacherous roads. So she made a fatal decision to hitchhike. Two days later, Ian Beely picked up his girlfriend, her two children, and the dog, and went for a walk to the area by Quarry Lane, Exeter. The area is very quiet, given its proximity with the city center, and sits between the Exeter Bypass and road running from Middlemore to Sidmouth, Exmouth, and the M5 service station at Cleast St. Mary. The small group of walkers hadn't ventured far into the field when Beely discovered the body of Virginia Mounder under a sheet of metal. The discoverer was a local man, Ian Beely. In fact, Beely was a murderer. He had used his 34-year-old girlfriend, Mrs. Jenny Clark of Silverton, as a cover. According to Mrs. Clark, Beely had come to her home the night after the body was discovered and, according to contemporary reports in the newspapers, he admitted that he had killed Virginia. However, his ruse of the carefully constructed image of a family man out for a walk, the staged managed theatrics of the body being discovered, and Beely's subsequent reporting of the fine to the police did not escape Detective Peter Ray's scrutiny. Upon careful questioning and despite displaying perfect composure in answering the questions about his discovery, it was brought to light that Beely had driven down the Tiverton Exeter Road where Virginia had been standing but supposedly came across her body shortly afterwards. What were the chances of that? Of equal concern was the emerging reality that Beely had driven past Virginia and turned around to pick her up. He was on the prowl that night. Upon the realization that police weren't buying his story, Beely switched to claiming, after picking Virginia up, she offered him sex in return for the lift. She apparently taunted him for his lack of sexual prowess, whereupon he just snapped and killed her. Nonetheless, his driving her in the direction of Tiverton, almost, in fact, as far as Silverton, his then girlfriend's village, driving the young woman back into Exeter indicates some sort of plan rather than deep panic and a murder that was the culmination of unforeseen circumstances. However, what is remarkably intriguing is the fact that he ended up at Quarry Lane. Quarry Lane has its own unusual and singular history. It is perhaps best known locally as the site of the Digby Hospital, 
Exeter Borough Asylum or Exeter City Lunatic Asylum opened in 1886 and closed in 1987. Today the site is a landscaped housing estate, but parts of the original buildings were incorporated into the later structures. The local asylum of Victorian architecture was built to house, treat, and sometimes torture England's unwanted and difficult members of society. From the 1960s onwards, the hospital environs also ominously became known as a focal point for a variety of bizarre ritual type activities. Although easy to dismiss as the stuff of nonsense, Many witnesses have, over the years, come forward to report in some detail what they variously described as satanic activities, ritual magic, and other sorts of macabre going-ons. In fact, a young man who attended the nearby Heli School in the late 70s claimed an old building by Quarry Lane was covered by what he called witchcraft signs, including a large pentagram in the center of the main room. Another witness describes seeing a number of men performing rituals at the very same location. Deeply worrying and sadly, this aspect takes on a rather greater significance as the Jeanette Tate story unfolds. What is interesting is that Virginia Mounder's actual murder took place not on February 1st, but on February 2nd, according to the evidence presented at the 1981 trial. And February 2nd just so happens to be Candle Mass, a satanic Sabbath festival in which sex and blood rituals are performed. On Wikipedia, it is stated that the period of 2nd to 21st February in some primitive cultures is related to the sacrifice of children and captives to the water deities, whilst another website suggests that the date is one where, specifically, 7 to 17-year-olds are taken for blood and sexual rituals. Moreover, such activities were hardly unknown to a number of people in the Exeter district from the 1970s to early 80s. With respect to Jeanette Tate, it is worth bearing in mind that many local policemen tasked to hunt for Jeanette Tate some three years before the Mounder abduction were, it was reported, frightened of the witchcraft element, whatever that might eventually prove to be. Add to this author Colin Wilson's insistence on writing about occult detectives and John Tate's regular allusions to the devil's work in books on the case, and one wonders whether there is indeed something to all this above and beyond the realms of dark tragedy. What is most intriguing is that Jeanette was abducted on August 19th, exactly 19 days before the marriage to the Beast Sexual Festival on the 7th of September, whereupon a female victim is sexually violated, sacrificed, and then dismembered. This might explain why her remains have never been found. And it just so happens that the number 19 represents the optimal expression for the energy of one as it reduces to one. One plus nine equals 10, which equals one plus zero, which equals one. It also implies the completion of a task that will take you to a new beginning. 
and a rebirth is about to appear. Old psycho ending and new beginning, which suggests the approaching fall equinox on 21st September. In Islam, there are 19 angels guarding hell. Moreover, 19 is a centered hexagonal number, meaning that 19 dots can be arranged in a hexagon with a dot in the middle and all other dots surrounding the center dot. Another example of 19 reducing to one. In fact, a six-pointed star perfectly fits inside a hexagon. Six points, six small outer triangles, and six inner angles within the two-triangle complex. The number six repeated three times, 666, needs no explanation of its malignant nature. Hence, whether Ian Bealey acted alone or collaborated with John Tate in some sort of satanic coven to sacrifice Tate's daughter for some kind of monetary award is still to be determined. Furthermore, Ian Bealey spent 27 years in prison for the murder of Virginia Mounder a comparatively long sentence, which is the result of the work done by Virginia's mother, Cleo Mounder, to have Ian pay for her daughter's death and can be construed as a punishment for his floundering on his duty to provide a sacrificial victim to his satanic brotherhood, some of whom might have even worked for the police. By the way, Cleo was interested in the many disturbing similarities between her daughter's case and that of Jeanette Tate. In addition to these revelations, Ian Bealey was both a friend and probably a relative of John Tate's second wife, Kathy Tate. Kathy, coincidentally, was resolutely against her former husband, John Tate, as reported in the Sunday Mirror in 1996 because of his child abuse and she supposedly knew that Bealey was Jeanette's killer, even though John Tate didn't want it to come out. On top of that, Bealey is known to have regularly visited Barton Hall Farm in Owlsbear, Jeanette's home, and regularly drank with John Tate. On August 19th, 1978, he was at the Milk Marketing Board's AI, Artificial Insemination, unit, no more than a mile away from Owlsbear towards Exeter Airport. Jeanette went missing around 3.25 to 3.30 p.m. And by 3.45 to 3.50 p.m., Bealey was at his work offices filling out a form. Bealey knew all the road shortcuts and knew the locals who also knew him. He had been to the Tates many times. Given how cunning and calculating he was with respect to the later murder of Virginia Mounder, one can ascertain how he might have planned the abduction of Jeanette, especially if he became aware of her work schedule. To demonstrate how cunning he was, he even volunteered in the 1970s for a local women's refuge while preying on them. Eighth, John Tate, cleared of wrongdoing with respect to Jeanette's disappearance and of a 1980 sexual assault, was detailed in the Sunday Mirror as being a serial child sexual abuser, especially with respect to Tanya Tate, his stepdaughter. 
According to the article, her sexual abuse started when she was eight years old and continued until she was 13 when she rejected his abuse. Tanya was 15 at the time of Jeanette's disappearance. John Tate painted a picture of a happy, loving family in his first work, assisted by Colin Wilson. What is most intriguing is that according to Tanya, Jeanette walked into the bedroom when Tanya and John Tate were engaged in sexual antics. This fact provides a motivation for John Tate to get rid of a witness to his debauchery. Why he wasn't investigated more closely by police who were trying to pin everything on John Black is a mystery. Moreover, after Jeanette's disappearance, strangely, certain Tate family members went to stay with a co-worker friend of Violet Tate, John Tate's 1978 wife, called June Beely, who happened to be Ian Beely's sister-in-law, further demonstrating John Tate and the murderer and pedophile Ian Beely had a close relationship. Ninth, Tony Hammond, Jeanette's 16-year-old boyfriend, had a mutual affection which Jeanette's father tried to disrupt, which makes sense given the nature of his abusive relationship with Jeanette. With this in mind, John Tate strangely allowed Jeanette and Tony to meet each other on the day of her disappearance so that Tony could accompany her on her paper route as she was supposedly frightened and wanted Tony to go with her. The question is, what was the purpose of John Tate's relinquishment? On the day in question, Tony happened to be late in meeting her. Upon discovering she was missing, he ran all the way back towards Ellsbear in a panic. He supposedly arrived at John Tate's house prior to Tracy and Maggie, and he testified that John Tate seemed unfazed by the news that Jeanette was missing, seemingly calm and disinterested. This was not the behavior of a frantic father. Strangely, detectives tried to coerce Tony into changing his statement and possibly physically assaulted him. Tenth, Police investigations of the Jeanette Tate case were intentionally mishandled. And, in fact, one of the main detectives investigating the Jeanette Tate case had a dodgy character. Devon detective Philip Francis Diss had been involved in leaking confidential details of criminal records and procuring others to commit misconduct in public office and was later arrested for it, as reported in the Western Morning News newspaper. What is interesting about this misconduct is that several witness statements went missing from the Jeanette Tate case, including that of the couple, the Gormans, who had seen the Maroon Triumph on the day of Jeanette's disappearance. Also, Tony Hammond was strong-armed into modifying his statement about Jeanette's disappearance. Moreover, Dis, as a Devon detective, as well as the police of Cornwall, seemed to turn a blind eye to rampant child abuse in the East Devon area in the 1970s. Additionally, Dis tried to mislead the public about the Jeanette Tate case. On the other hand, Detective Tony Fursland, an all-around honest policeman, was interested in cracking the Jeanette Tate case and suspected Ian Beely to have played a part. So he decided to go to Australia secretly in 1982 to speak to Michael Bastand, a friend of Ian Beely from his boy school days. Fursland was interested in ferreting out Beely's pre-knowledge of the August 1978 crime. Beely had known of the incident up to an hour before anyone did, even Jeanette's father, John Tate, 
as he later admitted. However, this secret visit was leaked to the press, who were waiting for him upon his arrival in Australia. Moreover, the witness was defamed as a double murderer who knew Ian Beely. Hence, notwithstanding Fursland's efforts, police higher-ups, probably with an assist from Dis, were able to redirect the inquiry into another direction. Moreover, Dis told the Echo, which was republished in 2011 at the time of his death, that Robert Black, the person the police were trying to pin Jeanette's murder on, had been driving a red transit van on the day of Jeanette's death and claimed it was a similar one to that scene speeding through Alls Bear at the time of her abduction. This, of course, is an outright lie as the vehicle spotted was a Maroon Triumph and not a red transit van. Dis and others had made clear there was no real evidence against Black and that only an admission would move things forward. Hence, it is clear that Robert Black was their patsy and Dis and some higher-ups were trying to mislead the public. Good police like Fursland were blocked from doing a complete investigation of Ian Beely. On top of this, the police amazingly never interviewed anyone at the Milk Marketing Board's AI unit where Beely worked, believing wrongly it was closed on Saturdays, the day the crime happened. In the end, it would appear to me that the community of Alsbear was a hotbed of pedophilia perpetrated on the children by even their own parents to such an extent that I would have to conclude that there was some kind of satanic ritual element underlying the depravity. This can be surmised from the children's own sexual antics with one another, John Tate's behavior with his own daughters, and his friendship with a known child abductor, rapist, killer like Ian Beely, who, not surprisingly, probably had ties to Satanism given his decision to bring his murdered victim, Virginia Maunder, to Quarry Lane, a known venue for rituals, and where he had previously and conceivably disposed of Jeanette's body after her abduction and possible sacrifice. Moreover, Ian was in the area at the time of Jeanette's disappearance and was most likely driving the newly sold Maroon Triumph of John Tate when he carried out the abduction. As to why Jeanette was chosen as the ritualistic victim on this occasion is up for debate, but her seeing her father in bed with her sister-in-law didn't help her. Her two friends who accompanied her on Within Lane just prior to her disappearance just might be a part of the coven of Satanists as they both were involved in sexual abuse of a boy their own age and claimed not to see the very car many witnesses saw on the road the day Jeanette disappeared, seeming to cover up what really happened to Jeanette. And finally, the evil group of devil worshippers in Allsbear most likely involved some of the police who were keen on sidetracking the investigation when things got too near Ian Beely or John Tate. After 45 years, hopefully this video will shed some light on who was really responsible for Jeanette's disappearance so that another innocent ritualistic victim We'll get justice.